Good morning, brothers and sisters, and very happy Sabbath. As we return to our studies today, as we look upon that which our Heavenly Father has provided for our education and admonition, shall we seek his guidance and ask him so that our minds may be open, that his angels will attend us, and that his spirit may work upon our hearts so that we might more clearly understand the mission and the duty that is yet before us. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, for the hours of this Sabbath, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to assemble together. We praise you for the lessons that are here for us to learn. We ask for your blessing. Father, we know that we have sinned and that we fall short of your glory. We ask you today, Father, for your guidance, for your direction. Help us and direct us now so that we might more clearly understand that which you would have us to do. There is much that is contained within scripture, within the spirit of prophecy, within all that you would have us to understand. Help us now, Father. Open our minds, <clears throat> direct us, so that we might more clearly understand that which you would have us to know at this time. Hide me behind your cross. May it be your words and not mine that are presented. May it be your concepts that we need to understand that are seen. Direct us now. Be with us, we pray. May your angels and your spirit attend us. For this we ask and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Before we dive back into our study in the book of Hosea, there was something that was brought to my mind as we had been studying over the last couple of weeks. So I'm going to share this. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Now, when we were speaking at the end of the study on Thursday, we were talking about our upcoming camp meeting. What has been the main focus on these Sabbath studies that we have been going through? Well, the focus has been not looking upon the sins of others, but looking upon your own sins and repenting and being converted. Okay, but if we were to describe this in a couple of words, what we would, how would we characterize this? Upper room. Yeah. The upper okay. room. Well, would we also not look at this as character and covenant? Well, definitely the oh, covenant. Certainly. Yeah. Now, there's a, another component to this, because as we've been identifying this all the way through, we are seeing that in order to properly understand the prophetic message, we need to have the element of chronology involved also, so that our characters may 
become more like Christ's, and we may be prepared to enter into covenant with him. Would you agree? Yes, I would. Okay. Very reasonable. Now I'm going to share something. We are all familiar with this. We have quoted from this over many years, but I don't think that we have fully and completely grasped all the concepts. So here we have a letter from Sister Ellen Harmon, right? Mm -hmm. Written December 20th of 1845. <clears throat> now, as we prepared for this meeting, it was interesting for me to note that this letter was written 424 days after the 22nd of October, 1844. And it was published 35 days after it was written. I find it interesting that the 424, when added to 353, would give us our symbol of 777. And it's noted here that this was four years to the date prior to William Miller's death. Okay, what were you adding together? 424 plus what? 353. Doesn't what, that add to 777? Yeah, what's the 353? I was just looking at components to point us toward the 777. Oh, okay. I mean, others better than I may be able to show a 353 and how that relates here. But to note that this was published 35 days after it was written, which it, of course is the multiple of seven times five, seven multiplied by the wise virgins made it interesting. Now, before we get into this letter, I think it's, it's worthy to note that this letter, when Sister Harmon wrote it, was offered very directly in that this letter was not written for publication, but was written for the encouragement of all who may see it and could be encouraged by it. Now, very quickly, to Brother Jacobs, as God has shown me in Holy Vision, the travels of the Advent people to the Holy City and the rich reward to be given to those who wait the return of their Lord from the wedding, it may be my duty to give you a short sketch of what God has revealed to me. Now, again, this was written December 20th of 1845. Who is she referring to as the Advent people? The Millerites. Isn't she referring to those that would wait for the advent, the return of Christ? Yeah. Does that's that mean... That's how they determined it. Okay. Does that mean that that's a specific church? No, that's a specific people. Thank you. The dear saints have got many trials to pass through, but our light afflictions, which are but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I have tried to bring back a good report and a few grapes from the heavenly Canaan, for which many would stone me, as the congregation bade stone Caleb and Joshua for their report. 
that we find in Numbers 14.10. But I declare to you, my brother in the Lord, it is a goodly land, and we are well able to go up and possess it. Let's keep in mind that this was written in 1845. Her report that we are well able to go up and possess it was set aside by 1863. While praying at the family altar, the Holy Ghost fell upon me, and I seemed to be rising higher and higher, far above the dark world. I turned to look for the Advent people in the world, and could not, but could not find them when a voice said to me, look again and look a little higher. At this, I raised my eyes and see a straight and narrow path cast up high above the world. On this path, the Advent people were traveling to the city, <clears throat> which was at the farther end of the path. They had a bright light set up behind them at the first end of the path, which an angel told me was the midnight cry. This light shone all along the path and gave light to their feet so that they might not stumble. Now, this entire letter is written as a single paragraph. As I went through this, I was led to take time to break this up for each of these comments to be able to be considered in and of themselves so that we might have a better collaborative study. So while she is at the family altar, she is given this, vis this vision. The bright light that was set up at the first end of the path behind them was the midnight cry. And if they kept their eyes fixed on Jesus, who was just before them, leading them to the city, they were safe. So the midnight cry was behind them, Christ was before them. Is that clear? Yes. But soon some grew weary and said the city was a great way off and they expected to have entered it before. Then Jesus would encourage them by raising his glorious right arm and from his arm came a glorious light which waved over the Advent band, and they shouted, Hallelujah. Others rashly denied the light behind them and said it was not God that had led them out so far. The light behind them went out, which left their feet in perfect darkness. And they stumbled and got their eyes off the mark and lost sight of Jesus and fell off the path and down in the dark and wicked world below. It was just as impossible for them to get on the path again <clears throat> and go to the city as all the wicked world which God had rejected. They fell all the way along the path one after another until we heard the voice of God like many waters, which gave us the day and the hour of Jesus' coming. The living saints, 144 in number, 144,000 in number, know and understand the voice, while the wicked thought it was thunder and an earthquake. Are we to deny the light that God has given? And if we do, what, what will be the outcome? <laughs> She's very plain about this. When God spake the time, he poured on us the Holy Ghost, and our faces began to light up and shine with the glory of God as Moses did when he came down from Mount Sinai, which we find in Exodus 34, 30 to 34. By this time, the 144,000 were all sealed and perfectly united. 
On their foreheads was written, God, New Jerusalem, and a glorious star containing Jesus' new name. At our happy holy state, the wicked were enraged and would rush violently up to lay hands on us to thrust us in prison. When we would stretch forth the hand in the name of the Lord and the wicked would fall helpless to the ground. Brothers and sisters, we are all familiar with Revelation 14, right? When we begin looking at Revelation 14, verse 6, we are dealing with what is called the three angels' message. What is the second angel's message? Babylon has fallen. Okay. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Yet, in the portion of the first angel's message, how is this being presented? For are we not to give glory to God? Now, in this situation, whether we are giving glory to God, or we are recognizing that Babylon is fallen, is fallen. We are shown that in this portion in Revelation, that there is a doubling. Is that not correct? That's what it will look like. Now, what have we stated when we are seeing a doubling within scripture. What is that symbol for? What do you mean? I mean, <laughs> it hasn't changed any. When we doubling. Yes, please. Second the angel's message. That's what we've attached to it. Okay. But I'm going to attach one other thing to this. The second angel's message is also the beginning of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> we need to consider this very carefully as we look at this. Then it was that the synagogue of Satan knew that God had loved us who could wash one another's feet and salute the holy brethren with a holy kiss, and they worshipped at our feet. Soon our eyes were drawn to the east, for a small black cloud had appeared about half as large as a man's hand, which we all knew was the sign of the Son of Man. We all in solemn silence gazed on the cloud as it drew nearer, lighter, and brighter, glorious, and still more glorious, till it was a great white cloud. The bottom appeared like fire. A rainbow was over it. Around the cloud were 10,000 angels singing a most lovely song. And on it sat the Son of Man. On his head were crowns. His hair was white and curly and lay on his shoulders. His feet had the appearance of fire. In his right hand was a sharp sickle. In his left, a silver trumpet. His eyes were as a flame of fire, which searched his children through and through. Then all faces gathered paleness, and those that God had rejected gathered blackness. Then we all cried out, who shall be able to stand? Is my robe spotless? Then the angels ceased to sing, and there was some time of awful silence when Jesus spoke. Those who have clean hands and a pure heart shall be able to stand. My grace is sufficient for you. 
At this, our faces lighted up and joy filled every heart. And the angel struck a note higher and sung again while the cloud drew still nearer the earth. Then, then Jesus' silver trumpet sounded as he descended on the cloud wrapped in flames of fire. He gazed on the graves of the sleeping saints, then raised his eyes and hands to heaven and cried out, Awake, 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 ye that sleep in the dust, and arise. Now, if, you, if you've observed the way that this is being presented, we have a statement and something that goes with the statement. That's what I'm seeing throughout this presentation. Then there was a mighty earthquake. The graves opened and the dead came up clothed with immortality. The 144,000 shouted hallelujah as they recognized their friends who had been torn from them by death. And in the same moment, we were changed and caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. We all entered the cloud together and were seven days ascending to the sea of glass when Jesus brought along the, cr the crowns with his own right hand, placed them on our heads. He gave, us, he gave us harps of gold and palms of victory. Here on the sea of glass, the 144,000 stood in a perfect square. Some of them had very bright crowns, others not so bright. Some crowns appeared hung heavy with stars, while others had but few. All were perfectly satisfied with their crowns. And they were clothed with a glorious white mantle from their shoulders to their feet. Angels were all about us as we marched over the sea of glass to the gate of the city. Jesus raised his mighty glorious arm, laid hold of the gate, and swung it back on its golden hinges and said to us, You have washed your robes in my blood, stood stiffly for my truth, enter in. We all marched in and felt we had a perfect right in the city. Here we saw the tree of life and the throne of God. Out of the throne came a pure river of water, and on either side of the river was a tree of life. On one side of the river was a trunk of a tree and a trunk on the other side of the river, both <laughs> pure transparent gold. At first, I thought I saw two trees. I looked again and saw that they were united at the top in one tree. So it was the, the tree of life on either side of the river of life. Its branches bowed to the place where we stood, and the fruit was glorious, which looked like gold mixed with silver. We all went under the tree and sat down to look at the glory of the place when brethren Fitch and Stockman, who had preached the gospel kingdom, whom God had laid in the grave to save them, came up to us and asked us what we had passed through while we were sleeping. We tried to call up our greatest trials, but they looked so small compared with the far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory that surrounded us that we could not speak them out. And we all cried out, hallelujah, heaven is cheap enough. And we touched our glorious harps and made heaven's arches sing. And as we were gazing at the glories of the place, our eyes were attracted upwards to something that had the appearance of silver. I asked Jesus to let me see what was within there. In a moment, we were winging our way upward and entering in. Here we saw good old father Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, Daniel, and many like them. And I saw a veil with a heavy fringe of silver and gold as a border on the bottom. It was very beautiful. I asked Jesus what was within the veil. He raised it with his own right arm and bade me take heed.
I saw there a glorious ark overlaid with pure gold, and it had a glorious border resembling Jesus' crowns. On it were two bright angels. Their wings were spread over the ark as they sat on each end, with their faces turned toward each other and looking downward. In the ark beneath where the angels' wings were spread was a golden pot of manna of yellowish cast, and I saw a rod, which Jesus said was Aaron's. I saw it bud, blossom, and bear fruit. And I saw two long golden rods on which hung silver wires, and on the wires most glorious grapes. One cluster was more than a man here can carry. And I saw Jesus step up and take of the manna, the almonds, the grapes, pomegranates, and bear them down to the city and place them on the supper table. I stepped up to see how much was taken away, and there was just as much left, and we shouted, Hallelujah, Amen. We all descended from this place down into the city, and with Jesus at our head, we all descended from the city down to the earth, on a great and mighty mountain, which could not bear Jesus up, and it parted asunder, and there was a mighty plain. Then we looked up and saw the great city with 12 foundations, 12 gates, three on either side, and an angel at each gate. And all cried out the city, the great city, it's coming. It's coming down from God out of heaven. And it came and it settled on the place where we stood. Then we began to look at the glorious things outside of the city. There I saw most glorious houses, which had the appearance of silver, supported by four pillars, set with pearls, most glorious to behold, which were to be inhabited by the saints. In them was a golden shelf. I saw many of the saints go into the houses, take off their glittering crowns, and lay them on the shelf, then go out into the field by the houses to do something with the earth not as we have to do with the earth here. No, no. A glorious light shone all about their heads, and they were continually shouting and offering praises to God. I saw another field full of all kinds of flowers, and as I plucked them, I cried out, well, they will never fade. Then I saw a field of tall grass, most glorious to behold. It was living green and had a reflection of silver and gold as it waved proudly to the glory of King Jesus. Then we entered a field full of all kinds of beasts, the lion and the lamb, the leopard and the wolf, all together in perfect union. We passed through the midst of them, and they followed on peaceably after. Then we entered a wood, not like the dark woods that we have here, no, no but light and all over glorious. The branches of the trees waved to and fro, and we all cried out, we will dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in this woods. We passed through the wood, for we were on our way to Mount Zion. And as we were traveling along, we met a company who were also gazing at the glories of the place. I noticed red as a border on their garments. Their crowns were brilliant. Their robes were pure white. As we greeted them, I asked Jesus who they were. He said they were martyrs that had been slain for him. With them was an innumerable company of little ones. They had a hem of red on their garments also. Mount Zion was just before us. And on the mount sat a glorious temple. And about it were seven other mountains on which grew roses and lilies and i saw the little ones climb or if they chose use their little wings and fly to the top of the mountains and pluck the never fading flowers there were all kinds of trees around the temple to beautify the place the box the pine the fir the oil the myrtle 
the pomegranate, and the fig tree, bowed down with the weight of its timely figs that made the place look all over glorious. Then we were about to enter the holy temple. Jesus raised his lovely voice and said, only the 144,000 enter this place. And we shouted, hallelujah. Well, bless the Lord, Brother Jacobs. It is an extra meeting for those who have the seal of the living God. This temple was supported by seven pillars, all of transparent gold, set with pearls most glorious. The glorious things I saw there, I cannot begin to describe. Oh, that I could talk in the language of Canaan. Then I could tell a little of the glory of the upper world. But if faithful, you soon will know all about it. I saw there were tables of stone in which the names of the 144,000 were engraved in letters of gold. After we had beheld the glory of the temple, we went out. <clears throat> then Jesus left us and went to the city. Soon we heard his lovely voice again saying, Come, my people. You have come out of great tribulation and have done my will, suffered for me, come into supper, for I will gird myself and I will serve you. We shouted hallelujah, glory, and entered into the city, and I saw a table of pure silver. It was many miles in length, yet our eyes could extend over it. And I saw the fruit of the tree of life, the manna, the almonds, figs, pomegranates, grapes, and many other kinds of fruit. We all reclined at the table. I asked Jesus to let me eat of the fruit. He said, not now. Those who eat the fruit of this land go back to earth no more. But in a little while, if faithful, you shall both eat of the fruit of the tree of life and drink of the water of the fountain. And he said, you must go back to the earth again and relate to others what I revealed to you. Then an angel bore me gently down to this dark world. Sometimes I think I cannot stay here any longer. All things of earth look so dreary. I feel very lonely here, for I have seen a better land. Oh, that I had wings like a dove. Then would I fly away and be at rest. Ellen Gould Harmon. And again, this was not written for publication, but for the encouragement of all who may see it and be encouraged by it. And this was written by Mrs. White at this time. Now, the reason we just went through this was this was a letter, again, not meant for publication. Yet, this brother chose to publish this in the day star. The follow-up letter contained a couple of very interesting points. Written March 14th of 1846. She again sends this, but please note, this written, this letter was written 22 days after the first letter was published. It was published 84 days after the first letter was written, and it was published 49 days after the first letter was published. Do these numbers mean anything to us? I'm sorry, could you run those numbers by again? Oh, is that what's being exposed 22, there? In the 22, 84, and 49. Yeah. Well, yeah, all of them. <laughs> so <clears throat> is this letter giving us a numerical or chronological point as to the importance of all that we have been studying recently? I would say it definitely has a bearing. That's for sure. Here we are with this letter tw written 22 days after the first letter was published and 22 being one tenth of 220. 
84 being 7 multiplied by 12, where this letter was published 84 days after the first letter was written. But that this was also published 49 days after the first letter was written. Published, it says. Uh, written, published, you're right, sorry. Now, all of this was being done at a time prior to those that came through the Great Disappointment had begun to truly understand God's law and his covenant with his people. Now she continues in this letter. Brother Jacobs, my vision which you published in the day star was written under a deep sense of duty to you, not expecting you would publish it. Had I for once thought it was to be spread before the many readers of your paper, I should have been more particular and stated some things which I left out. As the readers of the day star have seen a part of what God has revealed to me, and as the part which I have not written is of vast importance to the saints, I humbly request you to publish this also in your paper. Now, from the chat, it, this is also interesting that this letter was written on William Miller's 64th birthday, published on Pi Day, the day in which we, we would recognize the number Pi. Here we have then five witnesses, numerical, chronological witnesses to the validity of that which we have been studying. <clears throat> Is this not important to us today? Would you say amen to that? Amen. Amen. Um, God showed me the following. One year ago this month. So in other words, one year ago, February 15th of 1845, God was showing to her a throne, and on it sat the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. I gazed on Jesus' countenance and admired his lovely person. The Father's person I could not behold, for a cloud of glorious light covered him. I asked if Jesus, I asked Jesus if his Father had a form like himself. He said he had, but I could not behold it. For, said he, if you should for once see the glory of his person, you would cease to exist. Now, we're going to look at multiple points that are in this letter. This is for a collaborative study, for us to comment, ask questions. Let's look at this deeply. Before the throne was the Advent people, the church and the world. So she is dividing this into three the Advent people, the church, and the world. I saw a company that, were, that was bowed down before the throne, deeply interested, while most of them stood up, disinterested and careless. Those who were bowed before the throne would offer up their prayers and look to Jesus. Then he would look to his father and appeared to be pleading with him. Then a light came from the father to his son and from him to the praying company. Then I saw an exceeding bright light come from the father to the son and from the son it waved over the people before the throne. Now, 
This is a company that's bowed before the throne. That is deeply interested. While most stood up disinterested and careless. We've just pointed out that there are five numerical chronological points from the date of this letter. Each has something of import offered to us today. Are we to be disinterested or careless? No. These that are bowed before the throne offer up their prayers, and whom do they look to? Well, Christ. In the prior letter, those that were on the path to the New Jerusalem, where were they looking? Um at the city where Jesus was standing there and waving his arm. So in, or, in, in order for us to fully put this in perspective, those that were on the path, those that are bowed before the throne, are looking to Palmoni. Right. As they are looking to Palmoni, they are looking to the wonderful numberer. They are looking at one that is revealed in prophecy. Does that make sense? I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite catch that. Are they not looking to Palmoni, one who is revealed in prophecy? Amen. Yes. So as they are looking to Palmoni, they are looking to one revealed in prophecy that is connected with numbers. She continues, but few would receive this great light. Many came out from under it and immediately resisted it. Others were careless and did not cherish the light, and it moved off from them. Some cherished it and went and bowed down before the throne with the little praying company. This company all received the light and rejoiced in it as their countenances shone with its glory. Over the last many years, what great light has been rediscovered as it was in the Millerite time? chronology is it also not the seven times of leviticus 25 and 26 well, yes have we not seen that there have been many that have come out from under that light and resisted it yes have we not seen that there are others that have become careless and do not cherish this light oh yeah Throughout, is it not correct to state that every word given within the word of God is important for us, for our admonition, for our growth, and for our understanding of Christ and what he would have us to do?
Then I saw the Father rise from the throne and in a flaming chariot go into the Holy of Holies within the veil and did sit. Then I saw thrones which I had not seen before. Then Jesus rose up from the throne and most of those who were bowed down rose up with him. And I did not see one ray of light pass from Jesus to the careless multitude after he rose up, and they were left in perfect darkness. Those who rose up when Jesus did kept their eyes fixed on him as he left the throne, and he led them out a little way. Then he raised his right arm, and we heard his lovely voice saying, Wait ye, I am going to my Father to receive the kingdom. Keep your garments spotless, and in a little while I will return from the wedding and receive you to myself. And I saw a cloudy chariot with wheels like flaming fire. Angels were all about the chariot as it came where Jesus was, and he stepped into it and was born to the holiest where the Father sat. Then I beheld Jesus as he was before the Father as a great high priest. On the hem of his garment was a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate. <coughs> then Jesus showed me the difference between faith and feeling. Are we studying righteousness by feeling on Friday nights? that's that's not what that's not what i study what are we studying on friday nights righteousness by faith here is christ showing her the difference between faith and feeling are we to operate by feeling where it comes in our religious experience no, okay. she says we're supposed to examine the evidence. We're not supposed to be operating on feelings. I have a direct quote for that that I discovered yesterday. Okay. I can't I, mean, I can't put my fingers right on it. But... Okay. But if you find it later, please email it to me and then we can we can put it in with some of this on this on this document. And I, I saw. Go ahead. I can do that. Thank you. Any other comment? Okay. And I saw those who rose up with Jesus send up their faith to Jesus in the holiest and praying, Father, give us thy spirit. And Jesus would breathe on them the Holy Ghost. In the breath was light, power, and much love, joy, and peace. Where else did we find Jesus breathing on someone? When he gave him the Holy Spirit? Breathed exactly. on him the Holy Spirit? Exactly. So if at the first with the apostles, when he breathed on them and gave them the former reign, the Holy Spirit, what's happening here? Is this not a symbol of the latter reign? Okay, in the chat, the comment is made, John 2022. 20, Why? Because it says, when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. This is just before he sent them out. Okay. Thank you for the confirmation of this.
Then I turned to look at the company who were still bowed before the throne. They did not know that Jesus had left it. Those that are still bowed before the throne, have they received where Jesus has breathed upon them? No, no they didn't. Okay. They did not know that Jesus had left it. Satan appeared to be by the throne trying to carry out the work of God. I saw them look up to the throne and pray. So here they are looking up to an empty throne. Is that not correct? Yes. Okay. I saw them look up to the throne and pray, my father, give us thy spirit. So if they're looking to an empty throne and they are asking, my father, give us thy spirit, then Christ is not there between them and the father. Can you understand that? Can you see that? Yes. Okay. So for those that are bowed before the throne and do not know that Jesus have left it, when they are praying, Father, give us thy spirit, there is no intercessor. There is no Christ between the Father and those that are praying in that manner. There's then, your quote, bro. Okay. I sent it to you, and it's also in the chat. Okay. In the chat, as the quote reads, It is not the plan of God to compel men to yield their wicked unbelief. Before them are light and darkness, truth and error. It is for them to decide which to accept. The human mind is endowed with the power to discriminate between right and wrong. God designs that men should not decide from impulse, but from the weight of evidence, carefully comparing scripture with scripture. 2SP 371.1. So that's Second Spirit of Prophecy, page 371. Now this says the human mind. Does that not mean that all humans all living humans can make this, can, can discriminate between right and wrong, that they, they can make the choices between right and wrong to accept what, to see what to accept and what to reject? That's the way it appears to me. Thank you for sending that. You are welcome. Then Satan would breathe on them an unholy influence. So at this point, those that are still bowed before the throne and they are bowed there where Christ has left, Satan has then taken the position of Christ. In it, there was light and much power but no sweet love, joy, and peace. Satan's object was to keep them deceived and to draw back and deceive God's children. I saw one after another leave the company who were praying to Jesus in the holiest and go join those before the throne, and they at once received the unholy influence of Satan. About four months since, I had a vision of events all in the future. So first, this vision was given to her a year prior to this letter being written. And about four months after, she had a vision of the events all in the future. 
And I saw the time of trouble, which such as never was. Jesus told me it was the time of Jacob's trouble and that we should be delivered out of it by the voice of God. Just before we entered it, we all received the seal of the living God. Now, what book of the Bible would we give reference to that would show us the beginning of this time of Jacob's trouble? Would we not turn to Daniel 12, 1? And if we turn there, here is what we would find. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered every one that shall be found written in the book. So at the time of trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble, the 144,000 will receive the seal of the living God. Are we at this day in the time of Jacob's trouble? I don't think so. Okay, from the evidence that we have from the book of Daniel and the evidence that we're examining here right now, I would agree. The next thing that says, then I saw the four angels cease to hold the four winds. And I saw famine, pestilence, sword, nation rose against nation, and the whole world was in confusion. Then we cried to God for deliverance day and night till we began to hear the bells on Jesus' garment. And I saw Jesus rise up in the holiest, and he came out. As he came out, we heard the tinkling of bells and knew our high priest was coming out. Now, when Jesus rises up, what have we noted in the past? Probation. That, that's Michael standing up. Probation closing. Michael standing up. Is that also not a change of dispensation? Uh, uh, yes, I think so. When he, when this dispensation is changed as we are noting from daniel 12 we will begin to hear the bells on jesus garment he has stood up he is preparing to leave his position as high priest and intercessor and preparing to come to claim his people doesn't he put the, the garments of a warrior on at that point, though? Warrior or king? Yes. I think it's said both ways. Then we heard the voice of God, which shook the heavens and the earth and gave the 144,000 the day and the hour of Jesus coming. Then the saints were free, united, and full of the glory of God, for he had turned their captivity. And I saw a flaming cloud come from where Jesus stood, and he laid off his priestly garment and put on his kingly robe, took his place on the cloud, which carried him to the east, where it first appeared to the saints on earth, a small black cloud, which was the sign of the Son of Man. While the cloud was passing from the holiest to the east, which took a number of days, the synagogue of Satan worshipped at the saints' feet. 
Now, throughout this, I have seen multiple points that she is presenting before us that we can tie very carefully with other parts of scripture. But what was most intriguing to me is the chronological evidences of how this was written, when this was written, and how this relates to us today. Do we have any other questions or comments about this at this time? Okay, now we're in the chat. It says Isaiah 59, 17, verse 1, or excuse, 59, 17, 2, 1. Okay, I don't quite understand. And, Re and Revelation 3, 7 to 9. Why? And Revelation, uh, I mean, Isaiah 59, 17 to 19. Sorry, I didn't check what I'd written. It says, for he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and there was and was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, according he will repay fury to his adversaries recompense to his enemies to the islands he will repay recompense so shall they fear the name of the lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun when the enemy shall come in like a flood the spirit of the lord shall lift up a standard against him <clears throat> and then in revelation 3 Seven to nine, and to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, write these things that he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. And I like the 10th verse, too, because it says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So we can tie this portion in with this hour of temptation and how we come through this hour of temptation is either going to be that we're going to come through with robes provided by christ provided by faith that are spotless or we're going to come through with robes that are soiled spotted and wholly unworthy, and they will be the robes of our own making, right? So we must carefully consider where we wish to stand today. Now, Last week, we left in Hosea at Hosea 8, verse 7. As this prophecy was written, we have before us, for they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. It hath no stock, or it hath no standing corn. The bud shall yield no meal. If so be it yield, the strangers shall swallow it up. The admonition that we are given here. Now is our sowing time. It is a very important matter to us what kind of seed we are sowing. For that shall be our harvest. He that soweth to the flesh, to selfish pleasures, 
selfish indulgence shall reap of the flesh, reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall reap life everlasting. The warning comes to us. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that he shall also reap. Galatians 6 verse 7. In all our life, day by day, we are sowing seed for the future harvest. Dear brother and sister, will you ask yourselves, what shall the harvest be? In these prior letters, what we have just read and which we have just examined, are we not being shown the kind of harvest that these two groups are going to have? Are we not being admonished, shown and directed as to what Christ will do for us if we are willing to plant the seeds that he would have us plant rather than that of which we would seek to plant. <clears throat> the spirit must be carefully guarded else words will be uttered and actions performed that will not be a blessing to any one. Words are carelessly spoken and forgotten. But these words, for good or for evil, are accumulating a harvest. If in words we sow wheat, we shall harvest wheat. If we sow tares, we shall harvest tares. We need to awake and consider now, as never before, that we shall reap that which we sow in kind but the harvest will be largely increased. Sow one seed in careful, careless, unkind, harsh, overbearing, self-important words. The ears of our fellow men will hear them and will put upon them their own construction. They put upon their own construction, which, when worked out in another human agent, is reflected back upon ourselves and comes back to the originator. Sowing thus, we reap a very objectionable harvest. They have sown to the wind, they shall reap the whirlwind. How many of us can reap the whirlwind? If you throw seed in the air, what happens? Well, um, so during harvest, uh, they put the wheat in baskets and then they throw it into the air with uh, into a breeze or somebody fanning to uh, clear the chafe away. Okay, but here we're talking about the sowing time, not the reaping time. Well, then that's broadcast seeding. So if they if they sow their seed in the wind, if they just toss their seed up, is the seed going to take root? Well, it may, but you know, it's just gonna it's gonna uh, fly wherever it goes, and then it's gonna drop to the ground. It's not gonna be uh, a precision um, application. I guess what I'm asking is if if we try to put our seed in the wind. Oh, is, no. <laughs> okay. I get it now. So there is no way that we can sow our seed in the wind. That's folly. Every act of thoughtful kindness of obedience, of self-denial, prepares the way for others to be influenced for good. The agents who are earnest, who are active, zealous in doing good, are co-workers with God and have a rich harvest to gather. 
some 30, some 60, and some an hundredfold. The harvest is proportionate to the seed sown. Then how earnest should be our efforts to work in harmony with the heavenly intelligences. The universe of heaven is waiting to cooperate with the finite human agencies to save perishing souls, that they may win them to Jesus Christ. One soul saved for Jesus may save other souls. Thus the sowing goes on for time and for eternity. There are many kinds of sowing in temporal business lines, and these works require diligence and activity and earnest endeavor. But it is the glory of God, but is the glory of God the aim and object of life? What are you, a professed follower of Jesus Christ, sowing to? Every characteristic of selfishness, of self-love, and self-esteem will bring forth a harvest. Every exhibition of sowing to the flesh is making a harvest of corruption. But all who sow to the Spirit, ever keeping the glory of God in view, will reap life, everlasting life. I am the light of the world, said Jesus. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. If we are following Christ, the midnight cry is behind us, and Christ is before us. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. But Christ vindicated himself, saying, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came, and whither I go. But ye cannot tell whence I come, or whither I go. <clears throat> ye judge after the flesh. I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone. But I am the Father that sent me. John eight twelve to 16 This whole chapter teaches a lesson of greatest importance. When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, said Jesus, then shall you know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. For I do always these things that please him. And as he spake these words, many believed on him. They then said Jesus to those Jews that believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Is this not a great promise to us today? that we shall know the truth and the truth will set us free? Amen. If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceed forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he bowed not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinces me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Verses 42 to 47. 
if we are followers of Christ, we shall meet in our life just such things as Jesus met in his life. Why, he asks, do you not understand my words? John 8, verse 43. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If there is no light, there would be no shade. But while the shade comes by the sun, it is not created by it. It is some obstruction that causes the shadow. So darkness emanates not from God, but is a result of an intruding object between the soul and the <laughs> Now, just, just as we saw before, there are those that are praying before the throne, but they don't know that Christ has stood up, that he has left the throne and gone into the Holy of Holies. What intruding object, what intruding person was there between God and souls that attempted to take the Satan. place of Christ. Exactly. Is that where we wish to get our light, our feeling at this point? Or are we to have faith in the ministry of Christ? It is stated that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh because he yielded not to the command of God to let Israel go. <clears throat> After the plagues were removed, Pharaoh disregarded the evidence which caused him to yield when the plagues were upon the land. And because of his rejection of light and evidence, moral darkness came upon him. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Galatians 6, 7. They have sown to the wind, says God, they shall reap the whirlwind, Hosea 8, 7. Disregard of the light that God has given brings the sure result. It creates a shadow, a darkness that is more dark because of the light which has been sent. The Lord did not confirm Pharaoh in his impenitence. If a man withdraws himself from light and evidence, and yields to Satan's seducing art. He himself draws the curtain of unbelief about him, so that the light cannot be distinguished from the darkness. More light and evidence would only be misunderstood by him. The greater the evidence, the greater will be the indifference. This will lead the deceived soul to call darkness light and truth error. How powerful is, are these statements? As I've stated before, I'm not here to point fingers at anyone else. For if I do, I have more fingers pointed right directly at me. The more we examine the evidence, the more we either see how Christ is leading, or if we are indifferent, we will begin to call darkness light and truth error. Do we wish to find ourselves in the latter position? If I understood you right, I would say no. And you did understand me right. Because we should not be in the position where we are considering darkness as light and rejecting the truth that God has sent for this time. Israel is swallowed up. Now shall they be among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein is no pleasure. Verse 
do we wish to separate ourselves so that we are now considered by God as being among the Gentiles? For they have gone up to Assyria, a wild ass alone by himself. Ephraim hath hired lovers. Yay. Go ahead. They were trying to share their faith. What are you doing? I didn't quite understand that. Sorry. That wasn't meant to be heard, I don't think. Okay. I don't think so either. Yea, though they have hired among the nations, now will I gather them, and they shall sorrow a little for the burden of the king of princes. Because Ephraim hath made many altars to sin, altars shall be unto him to sin. I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. The world is fast becoming as it was before the flood. Satan has set up his throne in the earth, and the law of God is trampled underfoot. His Sabbath, sanctified and blessed in Eden, is set aside and polluted, and a rival Sabbath, the first day of the week, instituted by the man of sin, is exalted. The sins of the inhabitants of the cities and the towns have reached to heaven. And it is time for men to pray in humility before God. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is thy God? Joel 2, 12 to 17. Now, we're coming close to our time, the close of our time together today. There's a few minutes left. Are there any comments or questions regarding that which has been presented today? Or is there any reasons that others have for praise today that we should offer praise before our God? Um, all day bring all days bring reasons for praise. I'm just thankful for the way things are going that I'm able to 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 counsel some troubled souls the last few days. Okay. So my Catholic sister, yes. who happens to be a um, well, one of the highest uh highest things you can achieve as a woman in in the catholic um i i often think of her as, as a priest okay and she's she asked me for my merit for actually it was your uh the mary conundrum study because she's okay. very interested in mary and um some of the bogus things that have been said about her and when i 
I made that made a comment about it. Uh, Pope Gregory, uh, she clued in on it and she wants it. And so she, I sent me a message today, <laughs> and I, and I sent it back to her today. Interesting. <laughs> so that's this is praiseworthy. Very much. Very, very. I want to apologize for that interruption. Things happen, brother. That you are here is worthy of praise. We welcome, Amen. you know, we welcome you at all times. We welcome all that are willing to join. So know that you are appreciated and you are missed when you are not here. Amen. Okay, brothers and sisters. Any other comments right now? All right. Yeah, I got one one quick one. Go ahead. So uh, I was on the Palmoni site, Palmoni site last night. Yes. And I was just looking around. I <laughs> I never actually used any of the other functions except the calendar converter, and have never gone into any of the other areas and i noticed because i've been, i've asked theodore a couple of times for copies of his uh his charts <laughs> that either he he didn't see my message or it doesn't really matter uh but uh i was looking for charts that we had that weren't fuzzy because all the ones that i have are real fuzzy and you can't see them in detail and as I was going along, I noticed that that Palmoni site had posted charts from Theodore, from Stephen, and Iran. And they were all really nice looking charts. And if, if nobody else knows that, that's a place that you guys can go to and look at most of all the charts. Great. Thank you for that. Thanks, Ron. Okay, so then shall we close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have been able to spend today, today learning, being guided, and being blessed. We thank you for the fellowship, for that which is shared, we thank you, Father, for the opportunities that we've had to share with others. Father, there will be those today that need to travel. We ask upon them traveling mercies for your guidance, for your angels to be with them, for the divine appointments that you may have for them and for us. Help us now, Father. Direct us and guide us in all things, to your glory. For this we ask, for this we thank you, and for this we praise you, now and always, in the name of Jesus. Amen.